I came out of Penanga, this book, this compendium to work which I've seen building over the last period of years. I am speaking on behalf of the Vice Chancellor and the Chancellor, who unfortunately cannot be here tonight, but do um, forward their congratulations and their sincere thanks for the work which has gone forward into this work. We're delighted that this work which began through Team Akariki Research Institute has come to fruition. We consider it our obligation to finally get this out to the point where the scholarship is for everyone to see. The people I must acknowledge, to begin with, Professor Alex Frame, the director from 2004, Dr. Richard Benton, and Dr. Paul Meredith, for all three of them bringing this fine piece of work to its conclusion. Without doubt, without the work of these three people, this work would not exist. Alex remains an honorary professor with the university, <coughs> Richard an honorary lecturer, and Paul, we're going to talk later. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to acknowledge also the contribution of Mamaria Stevens and the Law School at Victoria University who applied and received funding from MB to enable the work for the editing and rewriting of this contribution. Victoria University Press in particular must be noted not only for picking this year's winner for the Man Booker um, Prize, but the second one to come into the press very soon. It should be noted that the three authors tonight have also very generously decided to donate all their royalties to the University of Waikato for the purposes of continuing research into the area of this book. This is a very generous offer which should be acknowledged. The University of Waikato would like to acknowledge a large number of people who have been associated with this work over the previous years. In particular, the founding director of Timata Riki, Mick Brown, for his leadership and his vision. The advisory panel, initially headed by Sir Eddie Dury, and including David Ogden, Denise Henare, Dr Matthew Palmer, Professor Richard Sutton, Dr Mason Dury, Professor Richard Salvi, Sir Tamti Reedy, Dr Parihua Milroy, Dr Manuka Henare, Justice Paul Hay, Dame Joan Mitch, in particular. I note with sadness a number of members who have passed on the advisory panel, involved including Sir Robert Mahuta, and Professor James Ritchie, and our own Kamatua, Bungi Haggy. Thanks also to the colleagues and the collaborators who have contributed to Team Akariki's Research Institute, and again, the list here is a long one that must be noted. The Honourable Justice Baragwanath, Professor Richard Bedford, Dr Margaret Bedgood, Professor John Farrer, Tonga Karina, Wayne Rumbles, Mr Tom Rowa, Joe Ali C. Pahima, Professor Doug Sutton, and the former Governor General, Sir Aniad Satyan. I note again, sadly, Dr. Tui Adams, Bishop Mahuya Bennett, Nina Benton, Tihana Paniwara Brown, Dr. Paki Harrison, Timothy Hukyu, Henry Malvin, and Dame Evelyn Stokes, and Sir John Dure have passed away. But it's important to acknowledge also their contribution to this work. For as many people I'm sure I've left out, I want you to know that we appreciate it and we'd like to acknowledge all the effort to go into this fantastic piece. I was speaking before with Alex about the sheer weight of this volume. In my work as PVC, we are stuck in a time where scholarship has almost turned out by the month. And it's weighed now often in sort of very small pieces where the editors and the authors have not got time to put the thought necessary to make something of true standing to go on to future generations. I sincerely believe this work has got a legacy which will outdo all of us. And I think, fantastic. Really, congratulations. This is the type of scholarship that this university wishes to be associated with. Not just the university, but the School of Law as well. We remain strongly focused on Māori customary and bicultural law, and we pride ourselves in our partnership with Iwi. Our Māori Indigenous Government Centre, under the auspice of Dr Robert Joseph, we consider to be one of our flagships. We engage in research in this area nationally, regionally and internationally. Most of you will know that next year is our 50th celebration. And this year was important for us because we made it into the top 50 universities in the world under the age of 50. So that's great, that's a very high standing. Next year, we pass our adolescence and we're into the bigger world. That means we're up against the universities which go up for hundreds of years, sometimes almost a thousand. During this time, we have grown. We get a new building, we get a new identity, but throughout all of this, we will retain our values. The values in terms of the scholarship, in terms of the leadership and in terms of the vision of what we want this university to be in the future. 
I am now going to hand over to Alison Robinson, who is going to conduct some questions to the three authors. Let's start. Um, <clears throat> lost in the mists of time, but uh, I think I should say this, it might be helpful. Um, of course, we've said a certain amount about this in the book itself, and I, I you know, let people read the, the, book. the introduction. <laughs> um, but uh, the program initially, to, to which credit must be given to Professor Haverman um, for uh, securing finance way back in the uh, middle 1990s, but that was, a, if I may say so, a rather vague program, uh, which uh, was directed at uh, uh, laws and institutions for a bicultural New Zealand. That, that was what it was called. But as we got into that, uh, and, and there were several uh, objectives which came under that, that program. One, for example, was Māori governance. And uh, we see the legacy of that in uh, uh, Dr. Robert Joseph's um, present institution. Uh, and there were several other programs, uh, but we started to realize, I think around about 1998, after um, we did a very interesting exercise um, involving a journal I had found in the British Museum years ago about a journey that Gray, um, Governor Gray, and uh, the Iwiko Tehenhe had done in 1849 and 1850. And uh, to cut a long story as short as I can, um, uh, we were invited by the Upoko Ariki, Tumu Tehenhe, to um, to make a presentation on that, which we did in uh, the great theatre in Beitaupo. I stood in front of a massive screen uh, and did that. As a result of that, the Upuko Ariki asked us to go to meet with the carvers and tukutuku workers for the new meeting house at Beipukawa. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this is that um, that became what I, I've come to call the Tapeka method. People say, what's your method? I think you're going to ask us that. Uh, and, and the answer, my answer is, it's the Tapeka method. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that scholarship, which in his very kind words, uh, Al Gillespie uh, labor stress on, we went from the Institute to meet the carvers and tukutuku workers at a uh, Tanapeka meeting house at uh, Waihi uh, with Tui Adams uh, as our guide and uh, protector. And, uh, but it was a meeting of scholars. That's what it was about. Uh, the, the carvers and the tukutuku workers, they were the scholars of Tufare uh, Tuotanga. Uh, and we may have known one or two things as well as a result of our research into the journey that Gray and uh, Tumu's uh, uh, ancestor Ibiko Tehenhe. Um, so that was the key scholarship. So um, I now answer your question as best I can. Uh, so it was after that that we realised that we couldn't really take the basic and broad objective of the program forward unless we made a systematic study of Māori custom and And so how did you go about doing that? Because it's a huge topic. <laughs> we can all take a turn at answering that question. But uh, we went about it in a great variety of ways. Um, as Alex mentioned, we talk with people, and sometimes with groups of people, many times with, with individuals. We had a whole series of seminars that weren't directly related to this project, but which played a big part in it, and which are quoted, which, which we have quoted from in our book, uh, called the Pu Wanana Seminars, where we met with uh, very distinguished Māori leaders like Sir John Tudeh, um, and, and uh, quite a number of other uh, scholars and talk to them about our concerns about Māori customary law, what do they think the key concepts were, 
how do these play out in their own lived experience. So the Pūwānaung seminars are really to see how in the experience of individual Māori, knowledgeable about these things, Māori customary law operated uh, in Māori communities, because many of them have grown up in communities which were 100% Māori and de facto 100% Māori governed, if you like, during their childhood, and sometimes right up into the present. So that was one source of information, and we mined all kinds of things, and we found out many interesting, uh, <coughs> many, many interesting things. What surprised you? Give me an example. What surprised us? Well, one interest, well, I'm not sure how surprising it was, I guess it was surprising up to a point, was how some of these Māori um, customary law principles were still applied in certain communities where a high degree of autonomy remained. And I remember one, um, you know, uh, in Taitokoro, where uh, some time before we talked to our uh, friends there, uh, a farmer who was a rather impatient fellow, had several sons, he'd asked them to plough a particular field. They were a bit slow in getting on the tractor, so he got on himself. Well, unfortunately, he um, got on too steep a slope, the tractor overturned and he was killed. So at the tangi which followed, it was decided by the community that the tractor would be confiscated and given to someone else because if the sons had done what they were supposed to do, their father would still be alive. So this was a muru, if you like, uh, and the, the community <coughs> laid down the confiscation. Well, now there was no legal authority for this. I mean, if the sons had challenged it in a law court, they could have got their tractor back, and probably whoever got it would be charged with conversion or theft. But no, the whole community accepted that this was the proper thing to do. So that was Māori customary law being applied in, say, the year 2000. And uh, other people had given us examples of this kind of thing. So that there was a fair degree of autonomy in some communities for quite a long time. And looking at some of these things, you could see how many of these principles could be woven in to the general cust customary law, New Zealand, the common law, if you like, or even perhaps percolate into statute law eventually. So Paul, I'm wondering, you were, I was going to say, you were, you were quite young when you set up. I mean, right. you're old now. But, I've got some very good now. I'm still nervous. But I'm wondering what sort of role you played as, as the book came together. Um, well, I spent a lot of time sort of mining sort of, a lot of manuscripts. I think I actually first started to hear the um, Maori newspapers, and at that time they hadn't been digitised um, by Tataka Keegan. So I actually sat on the microfish page one, and then first page, uh, page 42, just worked my way through. Um, then, of course, in the, from two years, I think it was, they suddenly became digitised, so you could just quickly do a search online. So I actually spent a lot of time and then in the Turnbull Library um, uh, reading a lot of manuscripts, uh, and particularly I was sort of focused not so much on the work of our, you know, of our famous ethnographers like uh, Alston Best and Percy Smith, but their, their, their Maori informants. You know, what I became surprised was the amount of material that had actually been written. You need to find things in newspapers like John White advertising five pounds for 150 pages of uh, Maori custom. Um, so, I mean, to so give an example, like the two Maori tanga, um, I was sitting with um, Dame Joan Mitch, and Dame Evelyn Stokes walked in and she said, oh, you can have some of these papers, or um, some Ormsby papers from London, where I'm from. And you have a look at these. I said, have a look at them. And in there was a record of a hui. I said, oh, it's a hui. And here in 1911, we were discussing the term Māori tanga. And Dame Jane said, oh my God, I've been, for the last 50 years, I've been writing, you know, about everyone who believed that Sir James Carroll had coined the term in 1920 at a particular hui, where he told these young people, Kia Moki to Māori tanga. I said, well, um, I'll just have a quick search in newspapers and find it being used as early as 1842. So I think a lot of this, um, and talking with people like Dame Joan and um, still amazing people, uh, um, I was, we, Rob and I recently had lunch with her and she, she sat down and she goes, oh, you must be very proud of the book. I said, oh, yes. Yes, uh, now, let me tell you. And then we proved and critiqued several things. Typical of Dame Joan. Um, but, um, you know, uh, as far as early as 1842, there's, there's so much material there. Uh, the examples, you know, I was looking for two Turanga Waiwai and I started looking in the Bible. Uh, and actually, I think I've actually traced it back, um, 
I thank you. Thank you. Isaiah, Isaiah 66, 1. Uh, heaven is like kingdom, earth is like footstool, and I think, you know, so, and actually, I came to realise that the Bible was an interesting source of uh, Maori custom and law. If you think of the term uh, government uh, in the Bible, how was that translated? One thing's Ka We actually found it was only used once, and the term that they were using to translate government was actually Rangatiratanga. Um, you know, the terms like Rangatiratanga for, as opposed to Kumari, so, yeah, but I mean, I, so it's been a, I must pay um, particular regards to the, the, the library here, I uh, spent a lot of time in the native land court records. I think the library just walked past me and we're always here again today. Uh, but also um, the Turnbull Library, where there's so much information and in so much material. And to be honest, I think we've only really scratched the surface. I was going to say, you know, you would have had a stacked ceiling sort of information. How did you decide what to include and what to leave out? How did you go through that editing process? Well, <clears throat> We had to make decisions, so we did a lot of discussions between ourselves with our members of our advisory committee, which was a pretty august body, uh, and with, um, with other scholars and, um, and associates. Um, we, well, the first thing was to decide which ideas we were going to concentrate on, and there was a bit of a debate about that too. Um, uh, some people wanted to uh, cut it down to just a few, you know, manageable, yes, one there. Uh, on the other end, some wanted to include as much as possible, uh, and I think I won in the end by the look at the volume of the book. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, we had to decide first of all on the terms. Then after that, of course, is getting material, and it, that became a process of elimination, really. We, we collected a large amounts of data about certain things, like mana, for example, but well, we would go through these things and you find recurring themes. So you just need one good salient entry uh, to illustrate a particular aspect of, of the idea. And uh, so uh, many items kind of sorted themselves out in the long run. Um, and uh, we managed to get it down so that there's very little duplication in the book. I think there are only two entries where we actually have it under two different titles, two different sections. And we decided to do that because these two um, extracts from other longer manuscripts illustrated two different, two different ideas, but so beautifully uh, in conjunction with each other that it was worth you know, repeating them under the proper title rather than making people flip back through the pages. But apart from that, um, we were able to uh, select, I think, about the 600 most salient items uh, and um, then cross-reference them so that uh, not everything that you want to know about mana, for example, will be under the heading of mana. But there is a guide within the book which hopefully will help you to find the other ones. So who is the book intended for? Uh, well, um, <clears throat> the the Chief Justice at the launch in Wellington was kind enough uh, to say that uh, she thought that every lawyer in New Zealand should have a copy of it. Um, um, that was very nice of her or not, but it, it, it is aimed at uh, students, um, it's aimed at uh, public servants, people involved in the policy making process, um, judicial officers, of whom we have at least two extremely distinguished members I see here tonight. Um, uh, and uh, we, we have reason to, to hope as well that uh, it may be of interest to overseas scholars wanting to learn something of the customary law of the Batanata Whenua um, of Aotearoa. Just while I have this, can I just say that because the, the, there has been mention made of uh, two people tonight, uh, uh, Judge Mac Brown and uh, Dame Joan Metch, who, who in, in their own ways were extremely important uh, to this project. I, I, I can tell you that I personally delivered their copies of the book to them uh, in the last month or so, uh, uh, because they both uh, are not in the best of health. and. Um, uh, 
in the case of Judge Mick Brown, um, uh, I had a lovely afternoon with him, and as those of you who know Mick uh, it, it will um, understand, it was full of um, sort of mirth and jokes. Uh, and uh, in the case of Dame Joan Mitch, uh, I, I can perhaps tell you um, uh, she, she was also pretty perky and uh, was um, showing me the text of her new book. She's got a new book on, on the way. Many of you will know her work. Uh, it was excellent. Uh, she's got a new book on Maori teaching methods, uh, which promises to be very exciting. Just one addendum to that. I would say that the book is also aimed at the general public because it's actually quite interesting. If you open it up and start looking at it, you will find many interesting uh, uh, anecdotes with, within the pages. And we know of at least two quite distinguished people um, who claim to have read the book from cover to cover because once they picked it up and started looking at it, they thought, this is so interesting, we can't put, put it down. And I think that's a feat that well, Alex and I would um, find very admirable. <laughs> I was wondering, um, now that the job is done, what you're going to do with yourselves? <laughs> well, I've got a real job. <laughs> I actually work in administration, but my poor boss wonders one is what I'd actually do with <laughs> um, To be honest, I actually think there's... Um, Definitely, given the amount, given that we have any main scratches here, so I know there's a lot of material in there, and, uh, but you know, the scholarships with the whole digitalisation of scholarship, and then, uh, I was working with the AJHRs, uh, hard copy now they're online, uh, papers passed, this is the digitalisation of a lot of our, not just the, we've got the Maori newspapers now, we've got all the other New Zealand newspapers that are uh, coming on board, and there's a, a wealth of Maori. Um, customary uh, references in those in that material, so I definitely think there's definitely room for at least you know, at least another two volumes, really, um, for someone else. <laughs> there you are. That's the next few years covered. Gentlemen, thank you very much, and um, we ask you now to uh, close and give them a round of applause. <laughs> and if you'd like to refresh your glasses now, is the time to do it. Thank you. Except before you do, Jean, <laughs> the the brag noise. Good, Alice. I'm not sure I need that. Tenakoto, 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 katoa, to brag noise, to be English, tenakoto, katoa, katarenga. I just uh, very quickly uh, want to close just by also echoing uh, <coughs> remarks that I fully agree with that with Al and others. This is a wonderful and powerful book. It's also a beautiful book. So let me encourage you to look at that. Again, one of the things that Paul was doing was getting the illustrations at National Library so that they were of a high quality uh, so that they could be carefully reproduced in this book. And I think it really it did, it's done a marvelous job. Victoria University Press as well has done a marvelous job in this book. It's, it helps bring to life what is the fascinating material that as the Richard was just indicating uh, through those visuals to give it to more meaning. It will also, I think, increase its enduring value and significance for generations to come. I just wanted to, to pass on uh, some further apologies from uh, uh, Dr. Monica Hemeti uh, and also from uh, former Governor General Sarah Sakinard. Uh, Both of them are quite sorry they couldn't be with us. A little bit further afield uh, is uh, 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 Mr. Justice and Sir uh, David Baraguana. And he's written a particularly lovely book as our. Uh, Oh, sorry, article or news letter about this book and, and bags it in an inimical style. And so it was worth, I thought, to reading this to, uh, to you all. Dear Brad, Richard, Alex, and Paul, my grateful thanks to each of you, Richard, Alex, and Paul, for writing De Matapanenga <coughs> and Brad for sending it to me. The transition from a consummation devoutly to be wished to this mighty result must have been an immense task. But for me as a New Zealander of a certain age, destitute of my paternal grandfather's understanding in the office of Broadfoot and Finley in Tekuiti of the language of clients encountering the legal system, struggling myself for a time to represent members of a different culture with distinctive values, the result is an open sesame to hidden treasures. As was to be expected of such authors, the book is meticulously researched 
brilliantly selected the key themes and ideas, written with great clarity and eminently readable, and it is superbly presented. I am finding it wholly fascinating, whether dipping into areas of interest or simply reading it for enjoyment. The combination of choice of themes of illustrative citations is beautifully done. It presents law as it should be offered, through the history and culture and beautifully succinct exposition that brings it to life. You have created an instant classic that is a must for every lawyer or judge charged with dealing with indigenous issues and for everyone who cares about New Zealand society and identity. My warm congratulations and deep appreciation. I think that's a wonderful sentiment on which we can all share. So thank you all again, Mahadi Mako, for this occasion. Thank you to, uh, to the three authors, to our publisher. Of course, the book is here. Let me encourage you to look at it. One other final piece is just also let me thank uh, Richard Benton for his efforts in bringing the last act, I guess, of Te Mata Hariki Institute before it closed, which was a conference called Te Hono Hono. And to bring that to fruition as well with, through his hard work, working with all of the uh, contributors who had done papers for that conference in 2007 to revise and in some cases update uh, their presentations. And that uh, book was published by the Yearbook on New Zealand Jurisprudence from Tupperinga Faculty of Law. And that's also over here at the table for you to, uh, to look at or purchase. Uh, finally, my understanding is that the three authors are agreeable to kind of sit over there and <laughs> autograph copies of the book <laughs> if anyone's so inclined. It gives you as well just an opportunity to speak to them personally and thank you. But the, the, still, there uh, is a chance to uh, enjoy some of the refreshments um, and uh, both the liquid and uh, kai as well. And finally, for those who, have, who aren't aware, of course, we're uh, connected to this event in a sense. Uh, is just in a little uh, later. Uh, we are hosting the uh, annual Hartness Henry Lecture, the wonderful, the, the seminal event in the law school's uh, uh, scholarly activity of the year, of uh, the annual lecture sponsored by the leading law firm in Hamilton, Hartness Henry. And uh, this year we have the pleasure of Justice Joseph Williams uh, speaking and his address is on Lex Altaroa, and it naturally, uh, is a, this book is a perfect segue in a sense to uh, that lecture. So for all of you who are able to stay, we encourage you to do so and walk with us when we ultimately leave here to the PricewaterhouseCoopers Lecture Theater over the Management School uh, for that event. The formal lecture will begin at 6.15 uh, with the reception over there beforehand. So if you get dry here, uh, just walk up. <laughs> Thank you again for coming.